Thank you very much. Um, we can now have a discussion both regarding this session and if there are anything left over from the previous session that someone would like to comment on, uh, that would be okay. So um, please. V very brief uh, qu questions. Um, I want I want to challenge the the, the first um, the the first lecture, great lecture that we heard about the relation between violence and harm, and and by um, contextualizing the social importance of so clearly, a clear resistance has to generate some harm, uh, as you said, and then the questions of proportionality kicks in. My point is actually very brief. You opened up with the use of children. And, and I kept thinking about it because to the extent resistance is genuine and to the extent what, it's, what is at stake is the, is the true crisis of society, saying, I'm not going to take my child to this, assuming that the child was in no real danger and it was just playing there as we know it was, should we then not say, good, that's actually what we should, should be looking for? It shouldn't be just old bourgeois who participate in the uh, in the resistance, but also children as part of as part of what it stands for. Um, so maybe it's up to us to say, well, is it a illegitimate use of children? Well, actually, no. These are families that are. This is what they. This is what they stand for. Um, uh, for Jonathan, I want to. I, I want to say I enjoyed it very much. I want to suggest two slight um, other angles or perspectives. One is the relationship between thinking and ruling. Um, so the notion of law is not just as a rule in the sense of this is the rule, klal, but as a rule as it rules, it, it actually governs. So the relationship with thinking and governing, I think needs to be further explored and I think one of the most beautiful pieces that I can think that might be helpful in this is George Orwell's little shooting an elephant, where the colonizer rules and you have to shoot the elephant because this is part of ruling. For the benefit of the people, they ask you to shoot the elephant and you have to do it. And that's, it's, it's part of, I think, the, the dilemma that you cannot avoid that I think, that I think corresponds a little bit with uh, with what you're talking about, because the question is whether a rule can be a rule without an element of violence in it. So, so there's something I think that should be explored. Um, with respect to, um, I, 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 wonderful, I, I totally agree with you of the proportionality analysis you did, um, and and the and the general framework. I just want to introduce one more component that I think we may be missing. So when we say, okay, the, the pilots will not be, the reservist pilots will not be there, the, the special forces will not be there, clearly we will suffer a little bit. I don't think the actual you know, survival of the state will, will be harmed. The problem, maybe, if this is the case, then of course, there's, a, there's an issue. But I think there is another harm here, and that is the function of Tzva'am, the function of this is, we expect the military to, be a, to serve as a checking function. We expect people to say, that's, I, I know this is Air Force speaking here, this is Air Force culture speaking here, I, I admit this. We expect the pilot to say, we trust you to draw a line and say no more, and we will respect that. We may punish you later, <laughs> but we respect that because you serve as, as part of the checking mechanism, and this is why we allow you to bomb and kill people and, and do all that stuff. Once you withdraw, others will come, and they might not have this internal, inner, and that's a true damage to, to what we stand for. That, that's, it relates to what Jonathan was talking about, the thinking element. We, you know, that, that's a harm we have, to, we have to take into account. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'm thinking of in, in ruling that's in, or, or governing. So Arendt really um, wasn't a technical philosopher of law in any way. She didn't care about whether we, um, we govern by, by rules or, or edicts, or she, um, she just cared about the integrity of the rule of law. So um, I think that when, while Benjamin definitely considered 
every legal rule to include uh, an aspect of, of violence, both by invoking it uh, materi materially and conceptually. It is absolutely clear in his uh, in his work. Arendt denied it. I mean, she she she, she thought differently about the structure of of political um, <clears throat> of political power by enforcement. Um, um, However, uh, you are absolutely right in the sense that she was part of the project, for instance, of promoting uh, the new regime of uh, crimes against humanity, for instance, and new legal category categories that didn't exist prior to uh, to the Second World War. And that is, in this respect, um, um, obviously, enforcing these rules is violent. I mean, there's uh, law is very, very. Um, uh, course in its mechanisms. I mean, the only thing we know on what to do is, is, is to be violent. Even when a, when a bailiff puts a lien on your bank account, I mean, that's violence. That's the only thing we know. We know how to do in, in law. We don't, we, don't, we don't offer redemption. We are, don't care about, uh, about ethical categories such as uh, generosity. Um, we, um, we have really narrowed down the the role of what counts or the function of what counts in law to a very, very narrow set of uh, ethical categories and left the rest to private life, to religion, to culture, to you know, other things. That's uh, 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 just very considerative of, of modernity. One more thing about it, every rule, this is a point made by Fred Schauer, which I think is very valid. Every rule is, um, is jurisdictional. Every rule includes with it, I mean, like Kelsen says, we don't, we never see a whole norm. We all see fragments of norms. If we see the whole norm, every norm is also jurisdictional, which means, meaning that every norm empowers somebody to do something against or for somebody else. And in this respect, even from a technical point of view, every rule uh, um, includes um, uh, uh, power of somebody over somebody else, something, again, that Arendt, I think, didn't... Uh, um, um, I'm pretty sure she read Kelsen, but I don't know. Um, and the last point, just the last point to Edith about the, the promise and the, I'm, I'm abusing my uh, position as a respondent. This is not a respondent, this is a point about, about uh, promises and contracts and, and so forth. As a professor of contract law, I want to tell, I want to say that contracts are not that important uh, and promises are not that important. Um, first of all, promises sometimes are being abused by the promisee. The promisee doesn't always have a right to rely on somebody's, uh, um, on somebody's uh, pronouncement or obligation. If somebody even gives you an obligation, that doesn't mean that you have a right to rely on it. And the second is we all know that there are limits to enforcing contracts and promises. For instance, political resistance. Uh, it's encoded even technically within every contractual codex that I know, um, including, uh, including Israeli law. So if somebody comes and tells you, you have to give up on your autonomy, you have to give up on your right to resistance, you have to give up on your, uh, on your um, activity as a political person because you made a promise or because of contract, then the reply, the contracts are not that important. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a mechanism for arranging uh, relations of exchange within capitalist societies, but that's about the, the, the level of, um, we, we, we have this, again, if I will take Schmidt, we have this theological view of contracts, right? That comes down from the relations between Am Habchira, between the, the person, the, the chosen people, and it's never clear who made the choosing. The people made the choosing, the deity made the choosing, and this contract between them is invoked and re-invoked. And when Schmidt says that we have secularized this uh, relationship and, and, and made it part of, uh, of, of secular law, I think it's a very, very valid, uh, valid point. Uh, we rely too much on these theoretical remnants of what contracting and promising uh, means. It's a means to an end. Sometimes it's important, many times it's less important than what we think. Yeah, the, but that's one thing. Sometimes you have to pay damages. It doesn't mean you can't break the contract, but you pay damages. Nobody makes you follow through on the contract, but you have to compensate somebody. No problem with that. Uh, just, just answering the question regarding whether this is this should be a social. Um, maybe we should accept that as 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 the way it is socially. Uh, I think it, it. I think it's it's a matter of necessity. 
I mean, whether this uh, putting this child in the middle of the road, is it something necessary for the success of the struggle? Uh, is it something that contributed anything other than uh, maybe delegitimizing the other side in any way? Uh, or maybe symbolizing something, but there is something, I think that as a society, we have limits regarding where, where to put a stop, where to put an end to thing. And, and, and child seems to be a good, a good place to put that limit, especially that young child. If we don't put that limit, then we have what we had in, in, in Birmingham uh, of, ch of children getting into, into prisons or, or being, uh, or being uh, um, evacuated with water hoses and, 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 uh, and, and dogs. That's what happened there. Okay, so I think if we're gonna place a limit somewhere regarding actions, I think that's, that's a good place. But that's just, you know, personal opinion. Thank you. Thank you all for really stimulating papers. Um, I want to thank uh, Jonathan for putting the statement of, Tam uh, of Hannah Arendt, reminding us that she said, totalitarianism is a different category. Um, it circumvents the very nature of politics as empowerment. It is not a struggle between ideologies. And on that basis, I want to ask a question to Jonathan himself, and also um, a question to Edith or a comment to Edith. Firstly, to Jonathan himself, within that context of totalitarianism, the distinction between terrorism and resistance, I think, is in extremely difficult on the basis of belief. And you try to say, what's the difference on the basis of belief? And I would have thought in international law terms that it's more on the basis of the victim of the violence. In other words, whereas resistance avoids victimizing innocent victims, terrorism targets innocent victims. So I'd like your comment on that. And um, because as I said, <coughs> in the context of resistance to totalitarianism. And uh, as to uh, Edith, that comes to when you said one of the costs is the trigger, is the finger on the trigger whenever there is a political objective. But are we talking about a political objective in our present situation? And that is not a question only of the belief of the pilot who's acting. It is up to us, us as a community of lawyers, intellectuals, citizens, to decide with the pilots whether we have reached the point where this is not a political objective. This is beyond political. It is a question of the, the legitimacy of service to the state. I want to challenge the proportionality okay. uh, test. It's not a matter of, you know, out balancing rights. Even if the conscientious objector, and the question is whether you extend your analysis to conscientious objection, not only to nonviolent resistance, believes that his withdrawal from uh, voluntary service will not affect anything whether this you know, proportionality doesn't meet proportionality. It will not affect anything because I'm on the only person. There is a problem of collective action. I think that this is not a real matter for proportionality because it's a principled objection on Kantian more into principle and not utilitarian. Okay, thanks. So first, Francis, I, I, I did say this is not my interpretation of the act. Uh, when I'm interviewing, I'm always saying those people, those pilots have served under Bibi Netanyahu's government uh, many, year, many years, including in the West Bank. But I also said that it doesn't really matter because those who will want to use the same method next time, they won't care for us, uh, giving them the beautiful argument that this is not a political resistance, this is uh, resisting against uh, the losing of the democratic identity of Israel. Once you did it, once you crossed the line, this is now uh, a weapon that uh, will be used more easily. And uh, this is not to say that this is morally equivalent, but just to say, to, to describe the price, but it is a price, even if they will be wrong and, uh, and, and, and maybe even unjustified by doing so, they will still do so. Uh, and we can, we can I, I think, um, I, I think we need to admit that this is uh, part of the uh, side effect of the. The other side already did it. I, 
I agree. I, I, I agree not in these numbers and not um, this extensive, but I, I agree with you. And they did it even for less. Um, they did it for the joint service of the military. As just, but, but it doesn't matter who is right for the purpose of evaluating the price. And I, I yesterday I spoke with one pilot and I told him, do you think that this it's going to work this time again? Because once, like this is a bullet you can use only once and you already used it. So maybe it won't help this time. And he told me, you know what? When I'm considering whether this will help, it affects my decision whether to sign the letter or not. So they do. They, they themselves takes it into account when they decide if they uh, they act so or not. This is not to say that when uh, someone wants to refuse to serve according, not wants to, but but someone refusing to serve according to his uh, consciousness. This is an, another another story and needs to be checked uh, morally checked in a, in a different framework. But when talking about the doctrine of double effect, saying, "Okay, I'm leaving aside now my moral judgment of the act itself." Assuming that the good purpose, assuming that we all agree on the good purpose, on the good, uh, the, we all agree. We need to agree that stopping the legislation is a good cause. If you don't, if you disagree with me, you're not in my game. I mean, you, we can't start uh, uh, doing the double effect because if your intended outcome is not perceived as good, um, the the whole framework of the of, of the doctrine of double effect is is irrelevant, and. Um, um, you know, sometimes um, officers ask me, should we, should I quit? Not only pass. Should, wh wh when do you reach the point where you should quit? You say, I'm not going to be part of this game. And my answer to them, if they're good guys, is never. Just because what you said. Some people think differently. Some people think that, no, there is a point where you should quit. At, 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 in, uh, in our case... Uh, you said you're you're coming from the air force yourself. It's not that easily to replace them. Um, re really, I, I don't want to think of the day after. But if really, if they will um, activate the warning, Houston, we have a problem. Is uh, is undermining the the situation we'll be in. So you're right, but. It, 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 but it will take time. And you know what? This is not, it's not a philosophical observation. It's just a way of analyzing the reality. Reality, it is one of the idea of uh, central problem now. Who are the next high ranked officers? Uh, may, maybe for us, we, we all, whoever is against the legal reform is really is very supportive or not, not all of them, but we may be supportive of the pilots' protest, but it's us. As a democratic state, we need to ask: Do we do we want to? Is this the democratic way, game we want to play? That the military we count on the military to arrange the the democratic um, shape, like to shape the identity of the state. So, but you you raise a good point. Thanks. Okay, maybe just one thing to um, this last point. I I totally sympathize um, with the notion that there's something highly undemocratic with um, finding recourse in high tech uh, or I, normally would I like a small faction of the society like these high techs who contribute nothing to the welfare of the world or a bunch of uh, air warriors who uh, who uh, mostly uh, throw bombs on uh, on on on, on uh, semi civilian or civilian uh, populations and and suffer no threats to their to themselves something that is even from the point of view of the ethics of a combatant is um, is 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 lacks honor uh, in a very sort of old-fashioned uh, way. No, of course I wouldn't. I, I'm not happy with that. But I'm resisting great powers, and I'll take my wins where I can find them. Uh, resistance is about forming coalitions and forming coalitions with people whom you don't like or you don't agree with, and with whom you have sometimes an inner tension um, um, uh, cooperating with, uh, and it's to an extent opportunistic and we're in a struggle and, 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 um, but I, but I do, I do agree to the, to the basic, uh, um, intuition. Francis, of course, you know, much more than me about international, I would, I would not presume to try to talk here about the basic, um, distinction between, um, the resistant and the, um, um, and the terrorists, and I totally agree with you, the terrorist aims to target civilians. The resistance sometimes 
uh, there is residual harm done to, uh, but but the, but the the kind of thinking of reflexive crit criticism of your own actions that Arendt demands is what keeps us honest in this respect. For instance, look at how the Israeli um, discourse is deteriorating in that sense because we keep on harming civilians and we say all the time, oh, we don't, you know, we don't mean to. We knew we were going to do it. We pushed the button. We knew the results were different than them. Why do we harm them? Because, you know, they're actually all the same. I mean, they're civilians, but they, 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 they're hospitable to the uh, to the terrorists, they don't. Um, they don't have. In, they don't resist them like we resist uh, us. Um, and um, uh, but when they kill our our civilians, we who call, call ourselves a militarized nation, every civilian or every male civilian is uh, a soldier in Mufti, actually. Uh, and so much of our uh, of our of our um, national mythology is based across across that. Then, uh, so I, I'm not breaking down the distinction, but I'm saying that it helps to keep us honest in uh, this respect. By the way, I think that uh, Schmidt in his Schmidt wrote a later book in the 50s called Theory of the of a Partisan that is many times uh, overlooked. In his notion that this distinction between combatants and non-combatants sometimes doesn't work because everybody is both. Uh, in a much more fluid uh, sense, both the, 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 the partisan, the ones of partisan, are uh, I, um, is targeting is, is already invoked uh, invoked there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this fascinating session.